Welcome. It's really nice to see everyone here. It's 2015. How about that? Huh? We're about uh, maybe a month away from our third year of being born. Erie as an organization. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many people here? Okay, I'll, I'll wait for the applause. Um, how many people here have not been to an Erie event before? All right, so we have a few people. Great, fantastic. So Erie started here as a student group about three years ago in a class Susanna Bustos was teaching called Entheogenic Shamanism. And a group of students came together and we wanted to have a, a larger dialogue on the topic of entheogens, but also on the topic of integration. We realized a lot of people were having ceremonies and journeys and didn't have a chance to come back from there. Weren't gaining insights. We're bringing lessons back into this world that could be uh, used here. So we decided to sort of develop uh, integration, peer integration circles and different modalities to look at integration. Uh, over the course of the last three years, we've held about a, uh, an event a month, which has been really fantastic. We have some wonderful speakers come. Uh, about two years ago, I think, um, Carmen came and talked with us, and that's where I first met Dr. Carl Ruck and Mark Hoffman. They came here and uh, um, watched the talk. So we chatted a little bit there, and I was really excited to see if he could come back, and luckily we were able to uh, get a hold of him while he was in, uh, in the area. So I'm really excited to have him here. Uh, the way the night is going to break down, uh, Dr. Ruck will talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, he'll present some topics to discuss a little bit later. We'll take a break, shake everything off, go to the bathroom, do whatever, stretch around. And then we'll come back and we'll have an audience dialogue discussion. So it should be pretty great. Um, bring some questions. Please participate as much as possible. It'll be uh, much more engaging that way. Um, so I'm really excited to uh, introduce our speakers tonight. Um, Mark Hoffman is uh, the co-author uh, with Dr. Carl Ruck, and uh, he holds a degree in religious studies and philosophy. Uh, he's living in Taos, New Mexico right now, and he's the editor of Entheos, the Journal of Psychedelic Spirituality, uh, which is a magazine you see up there on the table. Also, if you're looking, we have some books over there that both of them will be selling, so uh, check those out. Um, there's some really interesting books there. Um, I really enjoyed Persephone's Quest and Apollo, uh, Apples of Apollo myself. They were fantastic books. Uh, Dr. Carl Ruck will also be talking. He'll be uh, giving the first talk, and uh, he's a professor of classics at Boston University and authority on ecstatic rituals of the god Dionysus. Uh, with the ethnomycologists R. Gordon Wasson and Albert Hoffman, he identified the secret psychoactive ingredient in the visionary potion that was drunk by the initiates at the Eleusian Mysteries. And Persephone's Quest, Entheogens and the Origins of Religion, which by the way, there's a really beautiful hardbound book over there you might want to check out. Fantastic. Uh, he proclaimed the centrality of psychoactive sacraments at the very beginnings of religion employing the neologism, uh, neo, excuse me, neologism uh, entheogen to free the topic from the pejorative connotations for the word like drug or hallucinogen. This is really something that we've tried to emphasize here as well, uh, sort of veer away from using terms like psychedelic or drugs or hallucinogen and really talk about entheogen as finding the source, the guide from within, the spirit of creativity, etc. So without any further ado and with uh, great pleasure, I would like to introduce Dr. Carl Ruck. Thank you for inviting me, and if I'm not coming through, please let me know. I don't know how far I have to be from the, the microphone. Uh, originally, we thought that M Mark and I would spell each other, make a joint presentation, and he decided that wasn't going to work because I talked too much. And so he advised me, remember, you're not teaching them, and I wouldn't presume to teach you because I'm talking about something that most of you know uh, a, a great deal about already. And your talk, he said, in Bulgaria was excellent, but it was too long. And <laughs> it's going to be shorter tonight. I went through it quicker with him uh, yesterday, and he said, or a day before yesterday, he said, I think it's too short. So <laughs> it, can be, it can be stretched. Uh, but uh, I, have, uh, I, I want to talk about how I became involved in this study, and uh, beginning with the fact that um, something drastic happened in our cultural history in the uh, second half of the previous century and how I became involved in it. The subject of my talk is actually available in a different version. You don't have to read that. That's lifted from the website, but brainwaving uh, Wasson and the Psychedelic Revolution. It's been posted since 2010. Obviously, this is a bit different. So my topic is Wasson and the psychedelic revolution. You can see what kind of person he was. This is the last photograph taken of him. The accidental tourist. He did something that he didn't intend to do. And here he is, in fact, as that kind of tourist with his wife, Valentina, and his daughter, Masha, in Mexico. 
something that was of tremendous importance and also a great danger. Um, and I'd like to talk also about what the future of that revolution is. So inadvertently, when he disclosed his experience with the Mazadek shaman in uh, Life magazine, he launched something which has come to be called the psychedelic revolution. Now that's an interpretation of history, I have to admit, because some people think it was the Harvard Psychedelic Club that launched it. That was actually 10 years later, and then we're not quite sure, because I have a very intelligent friend who has researched the possibility that um, a cabal of Illuminati, who of course do not exist, uh, as early as 1930, uh, a cabal that Albert Hoffman may have actually belonged to, uh, knew about this. In fact, it may have been something that was known in secret societies through the ages. And it was a cover story, uh, the discovery in 1943, uh, in order to save the world because something or horrible was happening. I don't believe in such things, but it's possible. It ushered in a profound fundamental advance in modes of human cognition. The psychedelic revolution. What did he do? What did it do? Here is a, a letter from Albert Hoffman written shortly before he died to Steve Jobs. He said, Dear Mr. Steve Jobs, I understand from media accounts that you feel LSD helped you creatively in your development of Apple computers and your personal spiritual quest. I'm interested in learning more about how LSD was useful to you. He died before Jobs could respond to him. And similarly, some fundamental great advances in science have occurred uh, by people who claim that they were inspired by experiences they had uh, while under the influence of LSD. Isn't that beautiful? Um, many people have written about it. Uh, one of the more respectable people is Terence McKenna. And I love this quotation of his. Um, people are so alienated from their own soul that when they finally meet their soul, they think it is from another star system. But it also introduced a great problem because of recreational abuse. And it stimulated such ideas that your soul was, in fact, from another planet. Um, in the uh, 60s and 70s, historians of, re of religion refer to the marketplace of religions. There was a marketplace of religions in the 19th century as well, um, but you obviously know to what religion, <coughs> which is well-founded. Now, uh, I'm referring here. So the abuse meant that um, the words that were used for these substances that opened up a new vision of reality, like psychedelic and hallucinogen, they were inadequate. And so I made up, actually other people are now claiming to have made it up, but I really did, uh, <coughs> the uh, term entheogen. Entheogen means God within us. There's a Greek adjective, entheos, well documented. It occurs in Euripides' Bacchae, meaning that you're inspired with the deity within you. Those plant substances that when ingested give one a divine experience. In the past, commonly called hallucinogens, psychedelics, psychotomimetics, et cetera, et cetera, to each of which serious objections can be made. This is a quotation from Wasson. We are now rediscovering the secret and we should treat the antigens with the respect to which they were richly entitled. As we undertake to explore their role in the early history of religions, we should call them by name, unvulgarized by hippie abuse. Wasson was a patrician. He was a snob. Um, and many of his friends were hippies, but he didn't see them as hippies. The hippies were the other people that he didn't know. So, as he said, a group headed by the Greek scholar, me, obviously, advances entheogen as fully fulfilling the need, not notably catching the rich cultural resonances evoked by the substances, many of them fungal, 
over vast areas of the world in proto and prehistory. Many of them funnel. That's a problem for many people because we think that uh, maybe I'm over fixated on uh, mushrooms. And I'm not because I know about lots of other drugs too. And they're great plants, entheogens, whatever you want to call them. I know about them all. But there is something about the fungus that has a special um, tendency to stimulate uh, me uh, metaphoric and mythological uh, uh, stories. And um, uh, uh, Mark said I shouldn't say this, but uh, someone at a, at a conference said that I see mushrooms everywhere. And I said, that's because they are everywhere. But, but as a, a matter, matter of fact, um, we, uh, we think that the plants are there and we discover them. We're unaware of the fact that we and the plants, if we have a psychically attuned mentality, communicate. What shamans say is that the plant tells them uh, what it can do. There is a name and a history for the, for the, uh, for the plant, and the plant tells that, that story. It comes along with a ritual that uh, is necessary to correctly uh, pluck it, gather it, uh, so that you honor its indwelling spirit. It's the plant that tells you that. There's a song and a dance, and it's the plant that teaches that song and dance. But of course, that's impossible. What is an entheogen? It lets you see that what you thought was a myth is reality. Our normal, William James, you all know this quote, our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness, as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmsiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. So I became involved in this through my association with uh, Gordon Wasson, and as his last book, um, we collaborated on a book called Persephone's Quest. And in it, he tells once again the story of how he became intrigued with the mushrooms. How on his uh, honeymoon with his wife, Valentina, in the New York mountains, um, before dinner, they were staying in a cabin loaned to them by a friend. They took a walk in the forest. And she saw these mushrooms and loved them. She was a Russian emigre, um, knew their names, and uh, started picking them. And he was aghast, thinking that surely she would die even if she touched them. Uh, he later told me that this was their first marital crisis. They'd been together for five years before the marriage, and it had never occurred to them to discuss something so fundamental as their attitude to mushrooms. He said, I acted the perfect Anglo-Saxon oaf confronting a wood nymph I had never before laid eyes on. This is what they looked like about that time. Eventually, he came to mythologize the event as Persephone's quest, the Greek goddess, daughter of, uh, of Demeter, who picked a narcotic flower and made a union with her mate in the underworld. Uh, her quest for the magical plants that opened up the pathways of the underworld. Gordon was a banker, a very cultivated man, but a banker, and he always uh, deferred to experts in various fields, and I became his expert in mythology. But after we had uh, collaborated on a book, and I was at a conference with him, and uh, he, the subject, he was talking about Persephone's quest, and I think he suddenly realized that the myth of Persephone picking the flower was the myth of his wife, and he broke down in tears. So what did they discover? Some things are too sacred to have a name. Yahweh is not his name. There are four consonants that are the name of the deity. And Yahweh, anglicized as Jehovah, is the safe way to say it. Because if you should inadvertently hit upon the correct way to pronounce it, all hell would break loose. If you can name something this powerful, you can control it. And what hubris to think that you could control the deity. So when you have a, a plant like the mushroom that has no name, there's something strange. You think we have a name, but we don't. Fungus, first of all, is Latin. And it is the equivalent of Greek spongus, a sponge. It's a metaphor. 
It's not a name. It refers to the way that it quickly absorbs water and expands like a sponge. Mushroom is actually an importation from the French mousseron as early as the uh, 16th century, um, 17th century, 16th, 17th century, Shakespeare's time. Uh, champignon means they grow in the field, which is not true, and it's French. Um, it's not a name for it. Toadstool is a whole metaphor, a whole myth of the loathsome toad that sits on its uh, seat. In uh, Greek, um, mykes is not its name. It gives us the word mycology. It means slimy, mucus-like. Where does mushroom come from? Many people have speculated. I think I've found where it comes from. There is a late Latin verb, musare. It means to moo. It's mushroom. Musron. Couldn't be, but that's not a name, you see. You have, uh, you've made it into an animal. And the mushroom is intimately involved with metaphors of bulls and cows. So this is well known in the Celtic tradition, the nameless botanical growth. A witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the spurting dugs. James Joyce. So this event happened because Wasson, with his, um, his social contacts with the editor of uh, Life magazine and his wife, um, he arranged to publish what had happened in his visit as an accidental tourist to Mexico in Life magazine, partially as publicity because he was a banker. He was about to publish his wife and his investigations into the role of mushrooms in European art and folklore. And uh, I think only f 500 copies were uh, published. And he was very proud of the fact that the book immediately became um, a rare book. And it, it sells for thousands of dollars today. Uh, uh, but most of you know that it's been pirated, and you can download a copy with excellent color illustrations now from the web. But partially as public publication for that, uh, he exposed, the, he, he described their experiences in the now classic issue of Life magazine. This is the title page of one of the two volumes of Mushrooms, Russia, and History. Seeking to protect the shaman, he called her Eva Mendez. We now know that she was Maria Sabina. And in another visit um, to Huatla de Jimenez in Oaxaca, uh, he recorded uh, a complete ceremony of Elada, nighttime ceremony of Maria Sabina. So what kind of woman was she? Totally illiterate, married at the age of 10, but under the influence of her trance, of her visions, this is the sort of thing she sings. I am a birth woman, says. I am a victorious woman, says. I am a law woman. She had no education. I am a thought woman, says. I am a life woman, says. I am a spirit woman, says. I am a crying woman, says. I am Jesus Christ. My God, Jesus Christ, says. I am the heart of the Virgin Mary. I am transformed into God. I am the daughter of God and elected to be wise. On the altar that I have in my house is the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. I have her in a niche. I have St. Mark, St. Martin, horseman. He was a knight. And St. Magdalene. They help me to cure and to speak. Individuals I clap and whistle at that time. I am transformed into God. I vomit for them. It's that in me there is no sorcery, there is no anger, there is no lies, because I don't have garbage, I don't have dust. The sickness comes out if the sick vomit. They vomit the sickness. They vomit because the mushroom, mushrooms want them to. If the sick don't vomit, I vomit. Strangely, I have a friend who is a priest. Uh, his grandmother was a shaman in a suburb, uh, sub a suburban town north of uh, Boston from Lithuania, um, and she was a cure also. And she would cure people through the week, and on the weekend she would eat the mushroom and vomit the sickness out of her. <laughs>